Welcome, Mr. Englander, and welcome, Mr. Steins at the John Adams Institute. Mr. Englander, the John Adams Institute is very honored to have you here tonight, and may I congratulate you with the Dutch translation of your book, The Ministry of Special Cases. The title is Het Ministerie van Buitengewone Zaken, published by Antos Publishers. And a copy is available here tonight at the bookseller over there. So, buy it. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Uh, Englander will do book signing after the lecture, of course. Nathan Englander fits into a tradition of Jewish writers the John Adams Institute had the honor to welcome at its stage in the past. We had authors like Chaim Potok, Sol Bello, and more recent Jonathan Safran Foer. So I'm very happy to have you here tonight and talk about the diaspora of the Jews in Argentina and the desaparecidos. I don't know if the pronunciation is perfect, okay. Um, something we in Holland are very interested in since our crown prince is married to an Argentine. So everything related to Argentina interests us tremendously, I think. But uh, Peter Steins, our moderator for tonight, We'll discuss that topic maybe as well. He's a books editor for NSA Handelsblad, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I would like to mention here uh, also that we are a nonprofit organization, so if you are not a member or you would like to volunteer, please sign up. There's an information stand at the back of this room tonight, and uh, we are well, very happy to welcome you as a volunteer or as a member. Um, I would like to thank also Ambo, sorry, I would like to thank Antos Publishers for their cooperation uh, for this event tonight. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank also uh, my staff, and I would like to thank Odeon, and I would like to thank Ateneum booksellers who are here tonight as well. Thank you. Um, our upcoming lectures, um, I would like to mention we have the 7th of June, we will have Miranda July, and the 11th of June we will have John Adams, our namesake, uh, but he's a composer, uh, one of the most famous contemporary uh, classical music composers. Uh, and we will, in combination with Peter Sellers, they are bringing the opera Dr. Atomic here at the Holland Festival, and we will have a conversation with them together in het uh, Muziekgebouw aan het Ei. Um, Peter Steins, may I invite you to s introduce Mr. Englander here? It's, I will help you with the microphone because this is not very practical. don't even need a microphone in this very cozy atmosphere. But go ahead. <laughs> Everybody can hear me excellently, I think. Welcome and good evening. We're with a relatively small group, and of course, at the end of this evening, we hope that everybody can say in the future, we were there when Nathan Englander was in the Odeon in Amsterdam. You have seen a little bit of the program already behind me. Um, there will be a short introduction. After that, uh, Nathan Englander will read from his book. And after that, we will have a um, discussion, an interview. And um, Nathan will read two more bits from his book. And after that, there, are, there is room for questions from the audience. Um, and this is all about um, his latest book. Let me start by saying that eight years ago, a collection of stories appeared. It was called For the Relief of Unbearable Urges, and it was written by Nathan Englander. A strange title, maybe. These were nine stories. Nine stories, always a good number. Think of J.D. Salinger, who wrote a book called Nine Stories. And this was a book with nine stories about Jews. Jews in the old world, Jews in the new world, and Jews in the promised land. They were amazing stories. And to illustrate that, uh, let me give you three short synopses uh, for an example. In one story, 
a man from one moment to the other in a New York taxi, by the way, turns into an Orthodox Jew, just like that, while riding in this taxi. In a second story, a frustrated husband in Jerusalem gets dispensation from his rabbi um, for the relief of unbearable urges, as the title goes. And in a third story, a group of Jews during the Holocaust escapes uh, the Germans by accident, by boarding a train, and then by accident again posing as acrobats. And so the story doesn't relate that, ex that exactly, but so they are able to survive the Holocaust. All of these stories in For the Relief of Unbearable Urges were very moving, uh, but not only that, they were very funny too. And they were extremely well written. Who was this wunderkind who wrote this collection of stories at 20 years of age? It was Nathan Englander. He was born in 1970 in New York City. Uh, he grew up in an Orthodox Jewish uh, surrounding on Long Island. Um, and he studied at a yeshiva, uh, the Jewish school, uh, but went to State University at uh, Binghamton in New York. Um, he fell from his beliefs, as I gather, uh, when he was, uh, during a year, uh, abroad in Jerusalem. And probably in Jerusalem it was also that he realized that his destiny was to be a writer. Um, when he got back to the United States, he attended the famous writer's workshop in Iowa. And um, then he published For the Relief of Unbearable Urges which won the Penn Malamud Award. Uh, Malamud, of course, famous Jewish writer, Jewish-American writer. And uh, his book became a bestseller. And the rest is history, but the rest was also silence. Um, eight years we had to wait for the next book by Nathan Englander, The Ministry of Special Cases. Uh, and let me say, it was worth the waiting it was a great novel. It's a great novel about a terrible um, time in modern history, um, which was the dirty war in Argentina in the 1970s, in the second half of the 1970s. Um, Nathan Englander paints the lives of a Jewish family in Buenos Aires, a father called Kaddish, um, a man who earns his living by erasing the names on the graves of the pimps and the prostitutes of the um, uh, Jews in the Jewish community in Buenos Aires. And he does that because these names can be dangerous for the people who are family of these pimps and prostitutes. Embarrassing. And he is, well, a, someone who takes that embarrassment away by erasing the graves, the, the, the inscriptions on the graves. There's also a son, son Peto, um, who, like most children, uh, can't stand his parents and also can't stand any form of authority and gets into trouble with the government especially when in 1976 there is the coup of the uh, Videla Junta and uh, Pato is one of the first people to get, one of the first students to get arrested and he becomes a desas, well, I really can't pronounce it. He becomes a disappeared person, uh, as it says in English, English. And a third person of this Jewish family is a mother, Lillian, who can't resign to the fact that her son has disappeared and will not come back, uh, who is probably dead. She w doesn't want to believe that, and uh, she clings desperately to the memories of him, but also to the, which is for her this, a certainty that he will return. Um, the Ministry of Special Cases is a novel that combines the tragic and the comic. We will come to uh, talk about that and we'll hear a little bit about that too. Uh, it combines the absurd and the real. It combines originality um, and craft. 
and it combines um, plastic surgery, very strange to uh, see that together, and Tomb Raiders. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Nathan Englander. Now we got to lower it again. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. So uh, that, thank you for your excellent introduction. I can get to my chapter quicker. Um, he's a lot more coherent than I am as well. I usually stumble through this part. Anyway, uh, I indeed had a book eight years ago, and um, here I am back, cryogenically frozen. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll get to that too, but I've spent this time writing. People assume I must have built a house by hand or been in the army or done something, but I've actually just been uh, at my coffee shop working on this. Um, but we talked about the setup. It's uh, very strange to be in Europe. Um, this is my first European reading, um, firstly because you know history here. I spend most of my time in the States saying there was a dirty war. You know, so many people come up to me and have never even heard of it, and it's amazing here how much... Uh, people are aware. Mostly, I, uh, just about every reporter has mentioned the World Cup defeat in 78, uh, one after the other, with pain. I thought they were pained about the dirty war, but it's the, the World Cup that keeps uh, getting mentioned. But uh, yes, uh, the dirty war was March 24th, 1976, which was, uh, everybody knows Evita, which is uh, Madonna, but uh, Perón's famous wife, and a musical. But uh, it's Isabelita, his third wife, basically, um, who, he, when he died, she was left with the pink house, their seat of government. Um, and, and in a sense, it's with her that this started. A, a lot of the, the date is March 24th, but for me, there's always the before. And I guess this book, for me, really is about memory in many ways. You know, we'll, have our time to talk about it, how it's about the erasing of names and the erasing of people and the erasing of faces and identity. But I just got interested. I started this book when I was in Jerusalem and I became very interested in the inv individual in history where you're trying to live a normal life in a quiet town and history keeps invading and the government and military. And in a sense, our blindness is people, what it is to be part of society and how things work backwards. We say March 24th, but the chapter I'll read you starts on March 23rd. The coup ended the 24th. It started the 23rd, but it started with Isabelita, but it started long before that. And I'm almost always interested in that sort of social blindness where people don't, you know, in retrospect, we say it just happened, but nothing in a sense just happens. Um, so, um, yes, this is chapter six. And as we said, it's a, again, the story's so infinite for me. I, one reason it took 10 years is anytime I'd open a book or hear half a story or half a line, I was off for another six months. It's so gigantic, and every single life loss is an infinite number of you know, shattered lives that come off of that. But for me, I felt the story was really best told you know, as a family story. You know, we all know the mothers of the plaza, but this is, there is my one mother. There is Lillian, and there is Kaddish as a father and Pato is the son. And for me, the, true, the story could only grow to its true size if kept in this you know, processable you know, uh, place within a family. So chapter six is the coup chapter, and I'll read it to you now. Um, six. As four men from the Navy threw a career army man from the window, he was thinking his last thoughts. A retired colonel, his uniform covered in the ribbons and medals of a military regime. All those decorations were upended along with him as the blood rushed to his head. A medal came loose and clanked against the street. A chest full of honors and what good did it do him? I should have served in the Air Force, he thought. Then I would have wings. With that, not even the time for a cynical upturn of the lips, he hit the avenue of the Liberator and along with the countless motions that make up a late night in Buenos Aires that together are the heartbeat of any city in the world. Lillian Poznan turned her head on the pillow to have her last deep sleep before her fears turned real. Lillian didn't feel the city was light one resident when she woke up. She didn't feel, as she often did in the kitchen with her bills, that the country was united in spinning out of control. Looking into the street, she didn't sense that there were right then a million more working stiffs in front of a million more windows, all in it together, all but the colonel, his window still open, a cat curled up on its ledge. Lillian had slept well. She'd woken up rested to find that Kaddish still hadn't come home, and miracle of miracles, Pato had already left for school. She took her time getting ready. El Golpe, the sting, played on the radio. 
and she tried to remember what theater she saw the movie in. She stood in her stockings eating a pastry over the sink as she decided on the beta, the beta on Laval. Lillian waited for the old cage elevator that ran up the center of their building like a spine, the staircase snaking around it. She waited with a hand on the gate, one knee locked and one knee bent to compensate for the weight of her briefcase. The door to Cacho's apartment opened. Her neighbor was still in his pajamas and had a worried look on his face. He scratched furiously at one of his eyebrows and because of this, Lillian noticed that the other one was chapped and red. He was an early riser, a militant in his lifestyle. She'd never before seen Cacho in his bedclothes, never with a wrinkle in his shirt, even at the end of the day. She'd always felt he must keep an iron at the office, hidden in his desk. Are you home from work today, Cacho? Work today, he said, and went back to scratching. Work today, he repeated, standing up on his tiptoes to look behind Lillian and keeping an eye on the stairs. That's when the question turned entertaining, the best thing he'd heard in a while. Cacho gave a quick laugh. Work today, would you? Obviously, Lillian said and held up her briefcase heavy with files. It's rhetorical, Cacho said, almost screaming. The question is, would you go to work if you were me? Would you go out this morning if you were me? Lillian had never seen Cacho like this and, waiting for an answer to his rhetorical question, he switched to the other eyebrow and she saw that on the first there was blood. He had scratched himself bloody. If you were in my position, would you even leave the house today? I don't know, Lillian said. What is your position? What does it matter? You're already in it and still you go. With this, he dropped his hand from his eyebrow, only to throw both arms up in frustration. He retreated into the apartment and slammed the door. Lillian was so intrigued by this, she didn't notice for another couple of minutes that the elevator was out again. She had slept well. She was happy and took the stairs. It wasn't long before Lillian understood the position she and Kacha were in, the one Kaddish and Pada were in, the position they all were in, especially, but not really any more especially, that their leader, Isabelita, was in or already out of that morning. Lillian was walking down Avenido de Macho toward the pink house and the plaza in front of it, the route she took every day. Except there was a roadblock up ahead, and beyond that a tank, a tank in the middle of the city. It was preposterous, and Lillian looked to her right and her left to see if there was anyone to share this with. She saw a man going the other way who would not make eye contact, and then in an empty parking lot a little way down she spotted a Dodge pickup. In it were eight soldiers in uniform, in helmets even, crouched down, covering the directions of the compass. Three were facing her from the back end, where Dodge was stamped in large letters, and a pickaxe mounted across the name. The muzzles of the boys' machine guns stuck out over the truck's rear. Lillian looked behind her for the war, for the onslaught, and then again at these young boys, the kind that came knocking on the door for Pado, and then slunk off with him, record albums in a stack under their arms. These boys were neat or short-haired, and they were crouched down, guns at the ready. A flatbed truck with a tank on its back crawled across the next avenue. Another one followed behind. These trucks, moving through the city at a speed fit only for funeral processions, lumbering along. Where is the surprise at this speed? Trouble does not break out anywhere in the world, Lillian thought. War is not unleashed. It is slowly it is carefully installed. Lillian to look toward her neat little soldiers in their parking space. It's almost as if there should have been something to say. If they were not pointing guns, that is, if they were not in the military, she'd have said, there are tanks up ahead. But they probably knew that, could see them just as well as she did. Lillian turned around and went back to the last corner and took a different way to work. It seemed they were having a coup. It seemed they were having a coup, and for this, Cacho stayed home to scratch out his eyes. Frida was at her desk when Lillian walked in. She said before anything, Isabelita is trapped in the pink house. It'll be over before it starts. A day at the most, Gustavo was saying, we're back to a military government. You'd think they'd have come home, Lillian said. Kaddish was gone and Pado off to university before I got up. Classes must be canceled. Where would the kids go? Lillian shook her head. When do I ever sleep late? Adaptability, Gustavo said. 
He was out of his office and inserting himself into the conversation as if Lillian had been talking to him. It was Gustavo's way of being boss, of owning everything there. He stood between them and smoothed down his hair. We have inbred ourselves into supreme adaptability and now it's become a detriment. We'll get used to this government, same as the last, and if it turns on us, we won't even see it coming. We'll go down thinking, all is well. Gustavo said this as if the three of them were observing it from Switzerland. He spoke with a certain glee. Lilia nodded a thank you and turned her back to him and said very clearly to Frida alone, a truck full of men point their guns at me and still I go on my way. Gustavo circled round and returned himself to the conversation. After the soldiers, who else should come to work more than you? We sell insurance. Today is what we're about. It's our big gamble. We pay out. Others pay in. And, Frida said, dragging out the word, life, property, all the values shift. You'll see when things settle. Much will have become precious, and many will have no worth at all. Frida gave up. She asked for the advice that he dispense regardless. So then what do we do, sit here and wait? We get down to business, Gustavo said. Life and death you can't control now. It is only profit that can be arranged absolutely during a war. Who are we having a war with, Frida said. That's the point. Figure out the sides and begin to earn. With that, Gustavo went back into his office. Lillian took Frida's hands. You'd think Pato, he's very sensitive. You'd think he'd have turned back from school. A glass floated above the floor, held steady by five fingers pressed from above around the rim. The fingers were of a hand, the hand of an arm, and the arm hung disembodied behind the back of the couch. Lillian dropped her keys on the little antique shelf. She dropped her purse loudly by the wall underneath. The glass held steady, the arm did not move. The television visible beyond the couch showed the Liberator's Cup, River Plate versus Portuguesa. The little men ran back and forth. Lillian couldn't see the ball through the smoke, a thin gray cloud in front of the black and white of the set. Lillian approached, leaning over and kissing Kaddish on the head. He put his cigarette in the ashtray resting on his stomach and placed the glass on his chest. I'll know you're dead, she said, if I ever come home and find that cloud missing or that glass knocked over on the floor. What's wrong with ritual, Kaddish said. It doesn't hurt for some things to stay the same. No, Lillian said, she agreed. Kaddish sat up with his back against the arm of the couch, his legs stretched out. He moved the ashtray to the floor. Crazy day, he said. Very crazy. Lillian smiled and went to sit. Kaddish raised his legs and Lillian slipped in underneath and patted them down. She closed her eyes and let herself relax. She listened for the music that was always on and always too loud emanating from Pato's room. Lillian couldn't hear it and that only meant headphones or a grinding needle when the boy passed out. Creatures of habit, her husband and her son, they shared a great love for the comfort of sameness. He asleep, Lillian said. Out, Kaddish said. With a tilt of her head, screwing up her face, she stared hard at her husband, trying to understand. She stared hard at her husband and was already mad at herself. On coup day, on this day, how would she not race straight for his room to check? Then there was Kaddish, this man who understood nothing, whom she could not for a few hours trust. Out, Lillian said, with the hairy one, that kid that looks like an octopus, all head. Rafa, Lillian said, then is an afterthought distracted with worry. It is time you learned your son's friend's names. He came by, Rafa did, and they went off to some bar. Lillian pushed Kaddish's legs off her lap so that he sat up straight so that she could stand up and face him. What bar do you think is open tonight? How could you let him leave? She looked toward the door as if Pado might come through it. And then she asked Kaddish quite calmly, don't you have any sense of your own? I told him, he doesn't listen. Then tie him up, hold him down. If your son doesn't listen, why didn't I find you by the door sitting on his back? Uncontrollable, Kaddish said, by his father uncontrollable. Rebellious Jewish boys only listen to their mothers. For fathers, they have no use. Thanks.
you very much. Everything's in it. Jews and Gentiles, fathers and sons. Yeah, those are the four flavors. And, uh, <laughs> well, we also have yeah, uh, yeah. husbands and wives yeah, for yeah. a start. Um, let me first start by you were you were saying that every journalist talked about the 1978 defeat, which may seem a little bit strange, but it's logical because in Holland, of course, that was very much bound yeah, up no. with our position we were in. Um, when we were going there you as were, the favorites, yeah? we were going to play. We were the big favorites, but we were going to play in a country which, uh, in which you shouldn't play football matches. Yeah. So, um, I think that is. Uh, well, what, what's your what was your position? You were 37. Yes, um, my position. Uh, yeah. How did you look at that? Uh, not at the the football t tournament, yeah. of course, but at the coup when it was happening. Oh, that's how I got to this book, in a sense. To, you know, there are active reasons you write a book, and this is almost a reason of absence. I didn't hear about the coup. Well, we can get in 1977, I was seven. 76, I was six. So that was our, uh, but uh, yeah, so I was just watching TV for the next 13 years, basically. <laughs> but, um, but it's sort of that idea where, you know, I grew up, this is uh, a record for me. I, yeah. I usually mention the Holocaust already, but I've waited actually a minute. But, um, but just this idea of being a Jewish kid, I'm totally, I'm, I'm fourth generation American. I trace my family back to Boston. You know, I don't know any of the Russia stuff or anything like that. So it's for me this idea that I've given the memory of, the, you know, the Holocaust. You know, this is, you know, I'm in Europe now. Like that idea has nothing to do with me. I was given that as a cultural memory. I didn't have, re I don't know of lost relatives. You know, my relative that died, died as an American soldier, you know, in an American uniform. That's not, but this idea is we are bequeathed our cultural memories. You know, I didn't hear about the Armenian genocide. I heard about the Holocaust. And this idea where you're raised with this never forget, we must remember and we're never going to let these things happen in the world again. To me, as an adult hearing this story and thinking I started my life off with a full on, totalitarian regime in my hemisphere in my lifetime so it goes back to memory the first year it was our vice could you could you explain that you say a totalitarian regime in your oh, own this, life this or, or yeah it, that it was my hemis 1976 was it was bicentennial in america it was our 200th anniversary i remember that's the first year i remember there were new quarters there were uncle sam's everywhere selling cars because that's how we celebrate in america <laughs> by selling cars by selling cars um but just this idea that that's the first year I remember and already this was happening in my lifetime, in my hemisphere and whatever America's you know, connection to this government was and that it was just not, just not known, you know, just forgotten or, you know, because th that's what this book about is how we remember, you know. So for me, it was if I hadn't met these Argentine guys in Jerusalem many years later, I don't know if I'd know about it now. So because that was the, the reason that you were going to write about it? Meeting Argentinian well, in one sense, refugees in, in Jerusalem? Or? Uh, yeah, they don't call themselves refugees, but yeah, guys who left because there's no future there for them and, and you know, moved on. But um, yeah, they, they, well, I'd never, you know, again, maybe it'll ha it'd be different now with our new world order and our war on terror and with George Bush as president, but I'm not shaped by Jimmy Carter. I have no memories. You know, my life ended out, there's the house and the community, and that's where it ended. And it was strange for me to meet people guys my age or a little older who were the way they trust the way they talk everything about them was shaped by politics not on a world view not just their positions but you know how they let you into their lives or you know why they get stoned all the time whatever it is like they're really they are who they are because they grew up under this regime and that to me was stayed in my head as as the way the world you know a world that I didn't understand whereas your youth and your life at that time was or not in that time but in your youth was just uh, by religion uh, was, yeah, was determined yeah. by religion yes and a close an actively closed world but often um, you know america can be actively closed off you know we don't fight our wars at home which is i think about this idea of you know why so many of my literary heroes have lived abroad for so many years i don't think it's just accidental or good places to be poor or ways to sort of you know get your writing done in private and then resurface as i like to do but for me, just living in Jerusalem, there's a reason that to live in another language or to see a different world, like that changed who I am on a basic level was, you know, I'd say the book was as much born of meeting Argentines as it was living in Jerusalem and a city where, where again, the question of what it is to be an individual just comes to the fore. You know, this idea where it's the most, it is the quietest, it is a one block town, Jerusalem. It can't be any more boring. There's nothing happening there. And yet it's, you know, 
it's always the military and the, the seat of world religion and battling cultures and stuff's blowing up. And the idea is I just want to walk, you know, just in a, my day, which was I want to walk to my coffee shop, write my stories and come home. And that idea, do I have a right to that? What's my obligation? And what's, you know, this book's about community on many levels. What's, what's the government's obligation not to see that I get blowed up, you know? And I got mm -hmm. really interested in love of city and what it is to have a city crumble around you. And I think in romantic terms, in terms of a city most betrayed, Argentina, should be stronger than America right now. They have everything at the turn of the, you know, at the start of the 19th, 20th century. They were strong, you know, just endless land, endless people. They could do anything, and it is through corruption and corruption and military government and mil that they are kept down again and again, you know, as recently as 2001, their last crash. And yet these people, the Porteños, the people of Buenos Aires, are so dedicated to that city. And that also interests me in Jerusalem, where anyone who's I have one friend from Jerusalem here, but the whole point of living there is to say, I hate this country, I hate the government, I hate my neighbor, you hate everything, and yet you're like, and I will die and let this street drink my blood for Jerusalem. Well, what is it, you know? Uh -huh. And I feel like Argentines in the extreme love this city that betrays them again and again. And what was the moment that you thought, well, this is not going to be, because, because you were a short story writer, yeah. uh, which is a special craft. Yeah. This is a novel. At what moment did you know that these things you wanted to write about uh, were not going to be in uh, short stories, but were going to be in a novel? Um, yeah, I mean, I compare the, f you know, everyone just thinks it's, it, it's, it's a completely different form, first of all. I say it's like sort of writing short stories and switching novels as if I'd written a successful legal brief, and everyone's like, now a Broadway show. You know, like that this is, you, one uses words, and the other uses words, and to me it's a whole, it was a re-education. It was, again, another reason I'm so quick, but it was, for me, starting again. But yeah, it was about wanting something. A short story, a perfect short story can stand on story alone. You know, the characters have mm -hmm. to be there, but it, it can be literally an act of perfection and just be about the arc of story. And a novel is about character. The, the, the center of gravity is different. It's characters run through it. And, and, and I just wanted to tell a story that was so much more character based in that way. You know, where even I had a cast of characters and I've folded them back into themselves, you know, down to three people. But for me to be able to have people that take on that, you know, to live with them for that long was what I just wanted to do. And yeah, once I knew the story, that was that. So in the past 10 years that you worked on this book, I mean, it's eight years since the last book yeah. uh, appeared, but you worked on this book for 10 years. Uh, you changed as a writer. You yeah. became a different writer. Also. Yeah, I got old. <laughs> that, that happened. But, uh, well, not everybody gets different when he gets old. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the fascinating thing of it. Just your obligation to the stories. It's almost, they always talk about painting, you know, I don't know if it's the, San, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, that they, the city's always painting it. And by the time they get to the other end and finish painting it, they just go back to the beginning and paint it again. But it's, in a sense, laying life over story. Like, I was a different man. I was a boy who started and a man who finished it. But sort of that idea of, yeah, it's the arc of everything changes over time. I mean, between, for me, it was heartbreak. The second intifada was just shattering. And then I moved to New York for September 11th. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, the, again, in a story focused on an individual in a world that is changing around him, there were these two very strange, extreme life-changing examples for me on a personal level but yeah I feel like the world changed everything changed with this book I mean my mm. main my main one of my main metaphors in this book is habeas corpus you know just the idea that a person arrested it just was my basic sign of a democracy gone bad you know or the nation gone bad is that if you put people in jail and you don't enter them into a legal system and even that which is I've ended up with a political position now I mean it's the most basic thing to think you arrest someone you charge them and try them and let the, you know and this idea even that habeas corpus for enemy combatants has been suspended in America is just you know in, it, truly insane to me like so, like a metaphor breaking its boundaries in the worst possible way so what Bush is doing in Guantanamo Bay is more or less comparable to what the junta was doing in No I don't, I don't make it's funny cuz I talk about liberal radio like I was you know I was on in Berkeley and the guy says to me he's like you know they're using the Hitler's playbook I said like that's you know <laughs> I don't touch that it, Bush is nothing like the, you know, again, we don't, we can't do Iraqi numbers, but within a, a country, it, it, America has not declared war on its citizens, it is not, dis, you know, I can't make those comparisons at all, but on this one thing, yeah, you know, like there are endless, you know, I don't need to list for the room, you know, my, my list of Bush things is wrong, but the idea of core values of our constitution, of democracy, it's crazy to feel like a lefty for saying I believe in the American constitution, 
you know, that's not a radical position. But, uh, but yeah, certain things that, uh, when you talk it's about notice of change, yeah, we have wiretaps on domestic, I mean, it's things that, sort of what a society notices and doesn't notice, but, I mean, this is, uh, you know, in this, it, I'm talking into a microphone, but personally, it's funny because you write a book and I know the things I believe for this character and I know what I believe for Kaddish and I know the things I've come to learn. This is what, in my made up Buenos Aires, which better be real now, but in my made up Buenos Aires, like this is the, what society did wrong. This is what people did right. You know, not passing judgment, but this is how things happen. And now I feel like challenged. I feel like I accidentally personally challenge myself because I feel like, you know, I want to write a piece about it, but I feel like actually as an individual in society, I have to write something about hey, that I have to make my voice heard. I do feel like it is damn it. There are surely, you know, I'm sure there are evil people in Guantanamo who mean to do other people harm, but the fear for me is that there is one innocent man in there. You know, to me, for me to have my freedom when somebody else, it's not freedom if I have it mm -hmm. and somebody else has been denied it in that way. So I really do feel now a personal, like, you know, to, to stand by what I write, but in a sense that, that I, yes, as individuals, we have to say this is mm -hmm. an unacceptable way to live. We accept 30,000 gun deaths in America every year, to, the right to bear arms. You know, this 30,000 dead, that is heroic, what we will bury in a year so we can have guns. You know, they raid the speed, raid the speed limit 10 miles an hour, that equals categorically death. You know, and this idea that the thought that, you know, this paranoia about terror that we are willing immediately to suspend everything we believe in, you know, for that, I think is just unacceptable. We go back to the book. Um, the, um, you were talking about my Buenos Aires. Um, did you go to Buenos Aires to, to document yourself and, and to walk around to do and to, and how did you prepare to write about Buenos Aires in 1976, which is a completely different world, I guess, from yeah. what it is now. Yeah, I mean, again, it's hard to say I'm shy up here, but I, I feel like a very private person. We all can tell, I could tell you deep, dark secrets that will sound like deep, dark secrets, but they're not really my secrets. You know, it's that idea that we all have the things we can give away when we're being intimate, but there are other things that we can. And for me, I don't know, it's a very personal process. Like for me, a distant setting, a distant world from my own allows me to get to the stuff you know, say the father-son stuff in this book or the things, real deep primal relationships or message, things that I want to look at, I feel safer in a world that I get to build. You know, if this was my own world, if the dirty war had happened, you know, in Long Island at our mall, it would happen, I don't know what would happen in Long Island in suburbia, my boring suburban life. But uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think I'd be brave enough to touch it even. Like mm -hmm. the idea is it's such a large thing, I have to just own the material and that's, distant for me. But in terms of research, I have a terrible process. I have to come here to find anyone who's willing to talk to me. I, you know, I could drive everyone in my life away with how uh, insane I get with the research. But I write the whole book first, and then I do my research after in a reverse process. So. <laughs> and then you correct. Yeah. I, well, or don't I, you have to correct? Because you have sort of oh, imagined yeah, no, it so I, well. I, I learned this with the story. You mentioned the story about the acrobats, where I spent years. I wrote that story about, you know, the, the Schelm story about Hasidim and the Holocaust, but I probably wrote that story for five years. I wrote it so many times forward, the final draft I wrote backwards from the last scene forward, because I couldn't even see it straight anymore. But I thought I've written this whole world for so many years and given so much of my life to whatever it is, 20 pages, and I thought... And then, you know, Mendel is going to, one of the characters is going to open a train door. And I said, what if the door opens in and he's pulling it out? And I said, I'm going to spend all this time and he's pushing open a door that, like, what kind of respect is that for the craft, for him, for me, that there might be one reader who knows trains who loses this story and says, this is a stupid story. Cause that, and I, so I went to the New York Public Library and I got blueprints for 19th century German trains. You know, I found the cars, that, you know. And that's the way I feel like that is my obligation to story, which is the ministry I can build. It's my ministry. It is the exact right dimension. The door is in the right place. The hours are correct because I built it and this world needs it. But I mean, the example I use is the first chapter, Kaddish was kicking a can down the street. And, uh, you know, I gave it to my Argentine mafia. You know, they did not have canned soda in Argentina till 1983. It has to be a bottle, you know. <laughs> but for me, I didn't spend 10 years of my life in my room for an Argentine to read this book and on page seven to be like, this guy's wrong. You know, I, the obligation of a writer is the unbroken dream down to a comma. You need to be able, you know, we all answer, we text message and answer the phone, but if one wants, they should be able to read from word one till the end in a dream. Okay. Um, you were mentioning your story about Helm, uh, the acrobats. I sort of uh, gave a very short synopsis of it. 
Um, that was a story that was very much Isaac Bashevis Singer, uh, who also wrote, wrote about Kelm. I heard of that. Wrote guy. stories. Um, and of course, uh, your writing, uh, especially with your first uh, collection of stories, was very much uh, set in the tradition of Jewish American literature. Um, did you, has your writing evolved? Are you still as, as um, firmly embedded in this tradition, or do you feel uh, yeah, that you I, have I blossomed all, out? Yeah, I, I start sliding around in my chair with it. Like, I don't even connect to that. There are the writers that I love. Every book has to go on a shelf. It has to go on, like, you know, sensual massage, fiction, home repairs. You know, like, everyone, ca and I categorize everything. You know, I say just blase the Russians, and I'll throw Kafka in and Camus, too, even though they have nothing to do with Russia. You know, like, we all make up our lists, but for me, yeah, I'm happy to be included in that tradition, and you know, it's a, I'm very thankful for the people I get compared to all the time, but um, it's just my head. You know, it's that idea where, for me, this is my bureaucracy, and it's, you know, but uh, the only story is the one you mentioned. The only one where I acknowledge, because it's a story of tradition, is Chelm. I grew up on the Chelm stories. Like, that's where story comes from for me. And in, in that story, I acknowledge Chelm, and then I acknowledge Singer, and I acknowledge Leslie Epstein's King of the Jews, which is the best Holocaust novel ever written, I think. You know, that, that to me was about, but the other stories, that was part of the story. Otherwise, I'm really resistant to thinking of myself mm -hmm. in line for anything or part of anything. So, so you don't feel akin to other Jewish American writers in America that are writing now? Uh, not akin. I have my gang. You know, there are my friends, and there's the people I, I love. You know, again, it's very strange once you enter the writer. Like it's it's been an odd thing. Like that suddenly your world, your friends are contemporary fiction that we all you know hang out together you know I said people ask me what I'm reading what type of reading lately and it's like this very odd genre which is memoir written by friends you know it's like it's really because you'd be like that's why he limps you know like things you can't ever ask them like chapter six you know <laughs> what happened to me but um but yeah no I don't I don't connect that way I, I think I it's just my point I have to be tied to the work and I yeah I definitely don't make lists that way in my mm -hmm. head or work that way it, it makes me itchy because I think it becomes limiting I think it becomes limiting for a writer's creativity in an extreme way I like to talk about James Baldwin when he sits down and work does he say today I'm black or today I'm gay you know like that's <laughs> that destroys everything it's just his world and for me this is my world you mm -hmm. know it's just my it actually costs me time I can always check off what cost me another year in this process but the, all the pressure of being a Jewish writer or the next this or, you know, suddenly I didn't want to let any Jews into my book. I thought I'm going to, like, take care of this until I saw that I can let them into my book because they're all in my head, you know, that mm -hmm. that's my world and it's not, it's almost limiting that I should see the, it becomes Merchant of Venice as if I should see Jews as other, like my main character, Kaddish, he's not a man, he's a, he's a Jewish man, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that to me is, actually you know limiting to him and limiting to me and mm -hmm. you know I was raised in a closed I was a religious kid with the yarmulke like there were only religious Jews and everything else was other mm -hmm. well the, the, the comparisons that were drawn with the um, with the relief of unbearable bearable urges uh, were with the Jewish American writers if you look at this novel I think there are three writers that really sort of stand out as a sort of general influences in the book one is Gogol because there is a lot about the changing of noses, who will have yeah. a, a short uh, uh, part of that um, reading. Um, and the other one is uh, Kafka, because there are lots of, uh, well, you mentioned the ministry, the ministry yeah, of yeah. special cases, which is one big bureaucracy in which people try to find their way. Um, and the third one, <laughs> I forgot. Exactly. <laughs> um, Kinky but Friedman. <laughs> Jane Austen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always Jane Austen. No, 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 it's George Orwell, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because the totalitarianism you were yeah. talking about, the to totalitarian world. Um, is that, are these three writers really the, the, the sort of ghosts that hover over the Ministry of Special Yeah, I get, again, that's, I'm so thrilled for the, that's a great list. But for me, it's just, this is my world. You know, in a sense, I feel connected to them. They are heroes to me. You know, I love their work, but it's, in a sense, it's like I said, when I moved to Jerusalem, that's when I used to think Kafka made stuff up until I moved to Jerusalem. And then I understood that his stuff, he might make someone a cockroach, but it's probably a man who's born of an Eastern European bureaucracy and grew up in that world. Literally, you know, these things, these ministries, imagine I less tie it to, you know, Kafka than me going to the interior ministry in Jerusalem to get a parking permit. I mean, a nightmare like that you have never seen in your life, you know, 
you could cry, you know. So <laughs> Do you turn into an insect? You could, but that's the point is I feel like I connect. So that's it. I feel like I, it's almost, I, I, I guess I, you know, I'd go from town to town. Like I really believe in literature and I think the idea is I connect with those personal, as a reader, I connect with those people, you know, <coughs> bless you. Sorry. But, uh, but that's where it comes, in a sense, like when I remember reading The Magic Barrel when I was in Iowa, I was like 26 years old and I found The Magic Barrel and read it and it felt... By Singer. But Malamud. Sorry. Oh, Malamud, sorry. sorry. But uh, yeah, I felt like it was written for me. You know, like I was reading and I felt in conversation like this is a miracle. These stories have been written for me. And I feel like that's when a, when a book is working, that's how it should feel. And, that's, and in a sense, in terms of like chaos theory, I think it probably was written for, you know, that's a reader's right to, to say. So mm -hmm. yeah, their work I connect with, but in terms of world, it's almost now, and it's very weird in our Googleable you know, media focused, you know, world, it's, you're, you're almost aware of what's going to happen is, is I felt like I was working with absence in terms of other writers where I had to write my scene and then be like, is this going to be seen as Kafka? You know, in that way, in the same way we're building this Buenos Aires, I love Cortazar, I love Amado, I love, uh, you know, Borges, I love Marquez, you know, I love all the South Americans where I was like, nobody in this book is allowed to float even an inch off the ground, you know, <laughs> but, you know. No the, wings attached. No, no angels in the backyard, no, you get dropped from a plane, you fall, this is my world, you know, but it, it's, I feel like I was working with other writers in that way, with both love and respect, but, you know, mm -hmm. awareness of of, own, of ownership on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like you to read the first fragment. Um, it's from chapter 11, uh, it's two pages, 1881. Alrighty. Have you got enough light to read that? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. So, it show, you're, uh, no one believes I'm a writer. I'm the only writer without glasses at 37. <laughs> My friends know I'm watching TV and not reading at night. They're all blind already. Um, They've got to go, Lillian said. There are rumors, Kaddish said. Pato couldn't believe this was happening. Seated together on the couch, their knees touching, his parents had actually formed a united front. They sat there with their swollen cheeks and black eyes, they've just had nose jobs, and masks of white tape across their noses looking very much punched in the face. They're my books, Pato said. How can you even ask such a thing? You're the one full of conspiracy theories, oppressed long before it was in style. Now it's in vogue, Lillian said. Good for you, a trendsetter. Only the books have become dangerous. You've got to get rid of them. No one wants to be rid of you. Just because you're paranoid, don't take it on me. The door I went along with, who cares about changing keys? We're both paranoid in different ways, Lillian said. My way, and you may live to be anxious until a ripe old age. I haven't done anything wrong. It doesn't matter if anyone's really coming or not. It's your lot as a Jew to fear it. We are bred for the waiting. You're as crazy as he is, Pato said. And you don't show enough fear. Take yourself seriously and accept that the books are finally as subversive as you want them to be. Honestly, I'd rather give you my nose. I should have shown my loyalty with that when I had the chance. No one's offering that now, Kaddish said. It was a mistake in the first place. Who's going to breathe for the family without you? What if there's a gas leak? You're our Canero, Pato. We need you to test the air. If I had the money, Pato said, I'd take my books and move out and never speak to either of you again. By the time you have the money, Kata said, you won't need it because my life insurance will have long ago paid out. You can just move into the big bedroom. Enough, Lillian said. The books are going. Either choose the ones you know to be troubling or get rid of them all. I read half of them for classes given by the University of the City, which is run by the state. There is nothing wrong with having books. But you have heard, Lillian said, you've heard that they're dangerous, that they're guilt. Don't tell me you and your friends don't know of the craziness going on. Frida's niece was interrogated for 10 hours straight, no bathroom break, no, mo no water her mother kept outside. They wanted to know about her organizational affiliations. She's 16, Pato. She's captain of the volleyball team. Who knows what stories are true anymore? The honest mouths are shut. The graffiti is gone. This whole country has been white whitewashed. Go look, Pato said. The walls have been painted over. There's a ring of white as high as my head around every tree. I've seen the trees, Kata said. Lillian bit a nail. She'd somehow missed the whitening of the city. They're cowards, Pato said. 
They're supposed to burn banned books in the street. That's how it's done, with big bonfires and evil intent. This is the only ruthless, coercive system that expects us to destroy them ourselves. Do I have to ransack my own room while I'm at it? It's like, Pato said, looking around for an example. It's as if, and he looked down at his parents, together on the couch, Lillian's hands on Kaddish's knee from where she put it to still him. It's like what you've done to your faces. It's like the horror of a nation with one acceptable nose. Yeah, there's a very beautiful connection between the plastic surgery that both parents have had and what Pato is saying to them about the state of Argentina at this, this moment. Um, perhaps you should explain a little bit for the people who haven't read it yeah. why they, two people of, well, they are... 50 or 50-ish, yeah, um, why would they both have a nose job and what's, going, what's uh, going on and what's going wrong? Yeah, I guess this whole book for me, I just became more and more, you know, when I'd see what would happen in, in Israel, you know, just the way, I mean, it's now the 40th uh, anniversary of the 1967 war, basically, but I just think I'd see how nations make their decisions based on this is what we must do for history and this is what's loyal and this is our national story. and I just saw how they're edited, how every country has its history, and this is true, and this is why we have to do it. And then you see, but how can it be true when it's edited, when it's changed? And I got interested how we change the future by changing the past. And this whole book is about, er you know, Kaddish erases headstone names to erase links, the government's erasing people. And then I got really interested in the links that are a face. You know, there's a uh, Borja's essays that I read, Borja's co quoting Pliny, but he says to change a face, it is murder. You know, and I don't care about plastic surgery. I didn't care about it before. And if I don't like my eyes in a few years, I'll get them done. You know, it's that idea. It's not, but when you start building a world, you see what becomes important in it. And to me, in this world, the parents have huge noses, as does the son in this book. And it was the idea of them, what it is, where we make it like getting your legs waxed to change, you know, to get a nose job. But I thought this is another way, as much as a name or a family history, where they were undoing their DNA. They were undoing who they were. And you know, when Pado disappears is the horrible discovery. She's lost her son and looking in the mirror for her, there's no more, you know, when you become a parent, I like to look at the way things work retroactively, which is to have a child suddenly your own face is my guess, not as a parent, but you know, your own face will become that much more beautiful because you get to see your kids in it. You know, and this idea that her son is gone and then she looks in the mirror and she's the only other way she actually had him is gone too. And that to me really ties in with other issues of identity and memory and loss. And you should perhaps say why they have these nose jobs. Oh, Kaddish, you know, I got really interested, uh, you know, I don't do lit crit or whatever, I don't know if it's an anti-hero or whatever. I was also looking back to, you know, my speech about speaking out about habeas corpus, but this idea of how much intent matters, like, does it help if I mean to do something good and I don't do it? But the main character, everything pretty much goes wrong for Kaddish, and the idea is, I guess I got interested in looking in a deep way about how much intent matters. So Kaddish, he's sort of a ne'er-do-well, he, he chips off names. There's a, uh, there was a history of white slavery uh, for the Jews of Argentina, just like everyone knows when people came from Russia in the big first exodus of Jews. Always exodus with Jews. But, um, you know, they were the schmata dealers, the ragmen, you know, the businesses we connect them with, tailors. And in, in Argentina, they were the pimps and prostitutes. And the idea is the community wouldn't have them. They were, there was a middle class in Argentina and they were just interested in moving up. And to me, it was really moving. It's not a, you know, we're in Amsterdam. It's not a glorious job being a prostitute. It's not romantic. It's not fun, probably, you know. And this idea that these women could have died at the spindle or starved to death in Europe that, or were tricked into it or made that choice. But this idea that one Jew could stand in front of another and say, we will not have you buried with us. These women wanted to be buried as Jews and they forced them to have their own cemetery which I went to see a couple of months ago in Buenos Aires, but that really moved me, this idea of an eternal punishment, that these people, it's a pristine cemetery, it is trimmed and clean and lovely, and then over the wall, these knocked over headstones and weeds and despair, and that idea of anyone, I guess, you know, I, I believe in a moral fiction, but I was thinking of that thing of anyone who can feel pure enough to stand in judgment, like what is your soul that you can pass that judgment on another, and it really drew me to this story. So Kaddish had been paid by a doctor, to, you know, at this dangerous time where any such connection, you could be seen as subversive and killed to erase his family name off a headstone, and the guy has no money and uh, pays, pays Kaddish with nose jobs. <laughs> okay, we won't tell the rest of the story in this. Yeah. Um, um, 
one of the, the, the main themes in the book is, is, uh, is truth um, and whether it, there is a sort of uh, truth, well, whether truth is what everyone believes or whether there is a real truth yeah. that exists. Uh, and there are a few quotes in the book like, uh, truth can be denied, but it can't be undone. And another one says, if everyone believes the same lie, isn't it maybe the truth? Is that what you wanted to write, a book about truth? Yeah, it, it's horrible to say. I believe in books about big things. Yeah, <laughs> you know. The like, bigger the, the yeah, thing. Yeah, I just think that's, a, you know, it's 10 years of my life. I know how long I want to explore these things. That my, I'm a paranoid and I write paranoid stories. You know, like, it's that idea, like, why do I love oral? Why do I love You're a liar, kid? so you yeah, write yeah, stories about the truth? What, you asked me this connection, and it's sort of that idea, like, you know, all the books I love, I, all the movies I love, they're all about being trapped, mm -hmm. you know, in a world that's, you know, I felt trapped, but, it, but, but sort of the idea where I wanted to, nothing is clear to me, I can never choose what socks to, everything's overwhelming, everything's dizzying, except craft, and it's that idea, I, I just can't, I grew up religious where there's right and wrong, right and wrong, you do this, you do that, you know, that's all in the Talmud, all this stuff, which shoe goes on first, you know, like this is what you do when you wake up in the morning, this is how you go, it is all, you sleep on the left side or you sleep on the right side you know it's all there and this idea that the world is even your shoes yeah um, but sort of that idea you which, know, which shoe I don't remember do you have to put on first I, I, I forgot that one the left I'll say but we, you know, but it'll be like that. It'll say because your heart is on the, you should put on the right because it is the weaker side of the body and in deference to, it's all thought out. But, um, but uh, so yeah, just this idea, I guess I just really wanted to understand, you know, I, living in the gray is terrifying to me. And this idea, this, this idea of not knowing, you know, this is not a missing son. Even this idea of coming here, this book launched last week and out in America, I, I'd rather give up on my career than wait another month to see if I have one. You know, like everything's going right, it's all exciting, but honestly, I can't take the unknown, I hate it, you know. But it's that idea of, you know, I really wanted to explore these things, what is it? I had a woman come up to, it was really moving to me to say, like, I think it was her stepbrother, but that he was gone, she told me he was, she was happy when she learned he was dead. She said it was the worst that day of what, you know, to me, people give you these things on the road, you know, that, and actually another woman who, in terms of these, came to, in California to say her aunt was one of these prostitutes and used the money to bring her father and his family from before the Holocaust to say, you know, sold herself to save them, you know. That idea that can makes me cry right now, that she has to be buried over a wall, you know. But, um, but yeah, uh, just for me, this idea, I really, I wonder about that, you know. I wonder if everyone believes the same thing, does it, you know, with global warming as we pitch in America, it's not happening. If we convince the whole world, will that, if literally every last sentient being on the earth believes it's not happening, does that undo it? It, it might, you know, like I really wanted to know if Kaddish and Lily, and, because this was a, you know, about Pato saying about burning the books, that it was part of what happened in Argentina was a polite society. You know, this idea that you don't talk, and this idea that people would have to volunteer to not know their neighbor was gone, you know, through fear and paranoia, but, but I wonder in this book, if the parents stop believing, if the last two people believe in a son, if they stop, is he just gone? So yeah, I do worry about that and wonder about what makes truth. Because I like to believe, personally, I like to believe that truth exists. You know, that you can change history, you can lie to a nation, you can, it's not gonna, that there has to be something that's true. You were talking a little bit, bit ago about, um, well, the erasing of the past and how that changes the future. The, the, the very early in the book, at a very portentous place, I think, um, is a riddle, a Jewish riddle, which says, which man is better off, the one without a future or the, ma the one without a past? Um, which one is better off? I, I guess that's what sort of horrifies me. You know, the nice thing, I already talked about being indecisive, the nice thing about being a writer, I like that interaction where I can explore these ideas and turn them over and build a world and then it's for readers, you know, maybe somebody smarter out, you know, like that you can put it out there and it, I really believe, back to believing in literature, but I believe, the, I believe in the trickle down of it. I love that it feeds into your head and then it's there, like these memories, you know. You read a book, you know them than most of the characters better than most of the people you pass every day. Mm -hmm. in your life it really you know stays in your head but for me that I don't have an answer to that and I hate the idea of imperfection I guess I it's amazing ever you know the, to the point that you have to find perfection in this human world and say like this is done this is now perfect you know but but sort of that idea that I think to be dedicated I can use the Jewish girl example as like my you know parents only want me to marry a Jewish girl desperately you know this idea where like in one sense 
to be true to the past can be loyalty and sensible, and this is tradition, and this is family, and this is how the world is based, and this is society. And then to look to the future and say it's insane to like make a judgment of love based on money or looks or religion, you know. And this idea, I feel like the point is, if you go one way or the other, there is always loss. And I guess that's a horrifying. I, I don't want to accept that, but I think the choice to look only towards the future is to maybe lose something painful, and the choice to live only for the past is also to deny yourself a lot. So, yeah, to me it's just uh, overwhelming as a question. But, um, as we now know, you, you um, gave up your religion. You were yes. raised very religiously and orthodox Jewish. Um, in that way, you, you sort of, um, um, well, um, what's the word? Um, threw away the past and went for the future, and the future being being a writer. Is that what you feel? No, because writing doesn't conflict with that, you know. Uh, yeah, I see those as parallel discoveries. In a sense, I wanted my future, was, which was this future. But uh, I don't even see it as a throwing away. I almost think it's, you know, that's what makes the world interesting and alive. You know, this idea, mm -hmm. it's not even sensible, that idea of a continuum in that way. And I think that's it, is like accepting chaos. It doesn't make sense for every heterosexual mother and every heterosexual father to have a heterosexual child. You know, I, I mean, I almost feel like leaving religion is like that for me. You know, maybe, you know, different families and different, but this idea where you are raised in a world where you're told you stay in this world, and if you are miserable, it is your lot to be miserable within this world. And I feel like certain decisions are like that. And, and you know, for me, that was it. Like, this is not, it's very strange to have a whole universe. You know, I guess that's why I like books, is like building a whole universe, but to say, like, I don't belong in this place and just know. So, yeah, it doesn't even feel like a throwing away for me. It's just... I, I, yeah, you touch on a big thing, but that's why I write it here. I guess mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, in my own head, it's all, it's nice for me. Personally, I'm allowed to be confused, you know. For a book, I need to know, is there God? Is there heaven or hell? Is there a sun? You know, is it winter? I need to make these decisions. You are obligated. You owe that to them. You know, you need to know if there's a cosmic, if the world's expanding, or, you know. But if, in real life, things may real, be confused. They can be confusing every day. They are for me. <laughs> okay. Would you read to us the, um, the pages? Two eighty, two eighty-three. Um, yeah. With a short cut to read. Yeah, there's a cut. Um, yeah, I've never done this before, but uh, reading around the book, um, ring around the rosy. But uh, oh, so I guess I should set this up. This is a reader digest version. I'm gonna we'll do the whole book in a thousand little parts. Um, but uh, yes, this is actually a, a horrible. Mo but for Kaddish, who's left religion, you know, this is a moment right after he's which is for him a terrible, terrible thing, but he's actually, he's prayed, and it's very traumatic for him to go down that route. And then, for me, when we talk about departures, my last book is all rabbis, this one has a priest. But there's certain iconic uh, figures in Argentine, for those of you who know the story, but certain betrayals of trust. To me, you know, again, I left religion, I never criticized my community because people are supposed to be flawed and they're supposed to be hypocritical and they're supposed to be your neighbors and lie about what's going on in the house. But it's, it's to me what this book is about. I got very interested in community because there's a social contract. You know, if this town does not pick up the garbage, they have failed you. If they do not manage the water, and in that sense, sir, but there was a priest in the actual story who literally went to a bunch of families and took their money um, as if he was going to ransom their kids back and help them and he, I, you know, some versions that say he actually was there for their murder and torture, but he knew they were dead. You know, they weren't coming back. I thought what that idea is, a, you know, a man of the cloth to go collect money from the most downtrodden, pitiable people is just to me. Anyway, I'll read you two short sections, I promise. These are the things Kaddish did not pray for. He did not pray for permission or for guidance. He did not pray for forgiveness or for help. He did not ask for a sign or for solace. He did not beseech on anyone's behalf. And though Kaddish turned to a God above, he did not wish for a heaven to house him. For there is shame also in man's weak imagining, always eyes and eyes and eyes endlessly peering, as if there is no privacy to be had, as if entering heaven would bring no greater understanding, no context or comprehension, as if every motion of every earthly being is eternally scrutinized by every dead mother and dead son. This is why a man in deepest despair might fight it, why Kaddish, born into a world for the sole purpose it seemed of being kept out, would never dare to turn to God as he currently did. 
because he did not want to worry that the doctor might walk in and tease him, that the rabbi might walk in and own him, that all the dead from all time, all those with chipped names and those without, might hear his supplications and think that Kaddish Poznan had suffered so much he'd finally seen the light. It's a bully's heaven we have been given, a coercive place where all the self-righteous float around judging voyeurs with wings. All in all, it was not very much and not very long. And in the way the head works, and the way grief works, and the way Kaddish himself worked, barely a prayer at all. With knees on the floor and head on the floor and fists at his sides, all that passed, all that was directed, the little bit aimed at God, if it were even spoken, would have sounded like nothing more than this. Pado, my Pado, my son. The priest studied the pictures on the wall in Lillian's apartment. Again, he had her glasses perched on his nose. Lillian thought it sweet, the way he pointed her likeness or Pado's, mumbling to himself, his head darting round. It is a lovely apartment and a warm home that you've built. It doesn't feel so warm these days. That doesn't disappear. It lingers for your son to come home to. The priest smiled. Is this where he was raised? Did you buy it long ago? We should have. We've been renting for 20 years. Renting, the priest said, and turned back to the photos, pointing at one. In it, Pado had his feet and hands spread apart, reaching across the narrow corridor in which the priest now stood. Pado was literally climbing the walls of their apartment. Always up to mischief, Lillian said. And then she led the priest to her chair. She served him tea and put out a plate of cut sausage and the last of Frida's empanadas. They were the only viable things in the kitchen and she'd arrange them as best she could. The priest shifted in his seat. He held the tea but didn't drink. Lillian thought the fidgeting was hopeful, a sincere sign of a person feeling torn. The priest looked out the window. If you were a couple of floors higher, you'd be able to see the pink house from here. The very heart of the city, Lillian said. Can I ask you a Jewish question? I've always been interested. I'm not too well versed, but you can try. Why do you live here, he said. She was wondering if he meant Argentina and already insulted. She said, where? I'm not sure what you mean. In the heart of the city, he said. I'm not an expert on Jews either, but I know enough of your history. We live in a vast country that reaches to the very end of the earth, and most of the Jews live in this neighborhood, meters away from the seat of power at the mouth of the basin into which this whole country flows. Why wouldn't we? You tell me. For a people that doesn't want to assimilate, that wants to avoid vice and temptations, for a nation formed while roaming 40 years in the desert, why didn't you walk a little farther? Why did the Jews of Buenos Aires drop their bags and build their lives wherever the boat dropped them ashore? It wouldn't have been so hard to join your gaucho cousins in the north. There was a fine Jerusalem being built there, an uncontested, unmolested Jerusalem in Argentina where the Jews might have thrived. Staying here makes no sense when trouble seems to find you too easily as it is. You don't really think that, Lillian said. I do indeed. So many times nearly destroyed, one would think you'd look for a place where you wouldn't draw attention, and always you choose a place where you will. You think we suffocate the pink house with our presence? Do you think the generals turn their own selves pink trying to breathe while we suck up all the air with our giant collective Jewish nose? I wanted to know, and I asked. You get yourselves mixed up in politics in the newspapers. It's either the heart of the city or the heart of the matter. What doesn't make sense to a bystander is this Jewish hunger, this compass like a pigeon's for putting yourselves in the center of things. I'm not really sure it's the fly's fault when it gets eaten by a frog. You make yourselves proximal, and for that, there's no one else to blame. Yeah, horrible man, horrible conversation, you could say. Um, is it also a conversation that could have taken place everywhere, not only in Argentina, but everywhere where a, where a priest and a, and a Jew were in one room? Uh, not for me. Again, this becomes a, a world. I mean, it's, it's, I guess the idea is you, you, for me, these are huge things, but they have to, for every line like that that's in the book, there's a thousand that aren't, and each of them is an 80 page speech. It's like that idea of the things that are flying in my head, but that are of this place. And for me, Argentina, yeah, I guess for me, you know, aside from the Jerusalem metaphor, the New York metaphor, but that's, you know, I, I guess it could be anywhere, but not for me. 
for me it has to be right here. Mm -hmm. Right here in Argentina. Yeah. Um, well, we have, we have this conversation, and and yeah. and the mother is 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 really discussing the things with the priest, and then she, um, well, she still gives him the money. She still go because she's so desperate, and um, well, the book gets in a way bleaker and bleaker, and it it has no, it is not there is no conclude no real conclusion in the book. Do, do you think that's it's a selling pitch? <laughs> no, 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 no. The selling pitch I gave then already. Then it gets really funny. <laughs> and then, after that, it gets really funny. Yeah. But is it? Um, are you? Are you? Because you you say, well, I, I sort of I have, I have a moral thing to do in this book. But are you a pessimist as a yeah. writer? I, as I don't a writer even say I have a moral thing in this book. That's that's corrupting. I think mm -hmm. any political. You mentioned Orwell. Like I think Orwell can write politics because his head is politics. For me, this is not a political. You know, these are backdrops, but I would n never dare impose. I think it's truly corrupting to fiction to have a preconceived notion about a character or about a position. So for, it's more that I believe that fiction itself is moral, that I have like an mm -hmm. obligation to the world, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, we? I think I've asked everything I wanted to ask, but the, um, uh, maybe there are questions from the audience. And um, I would give the floor to everybody who puts up his hand. And I will repeat the question so that everybody can oh, hear can. it. I'll repeat it. I'm or you repeat it. it. Yes. yes. Okay. My name is Etienne Lelbaum, writer for uh, Living Jewish Faith. My name is Etienne Lelbaum, uh, writing for Living Jewish Faith, the magazine of the Amsterdam Progressive Jewish Congregation. Oh, then for you, I feel like a Jewish writer. <laughs> I'll change that for the article. No, I can't take it back. It's yeah. you who are saying Yeah, yeah, yeah. This. yeah. Okay. Um, my question would be this, um, the hero of this book, Kaddish, he earns his living by erasing names yeah. for the sake of saving lives. Yes, sir. Uh, a thing we call in Judaism, Pikuach Nefesh, as you, of course, know. Um, and the name Kaddish itself, it refers to the prayer of, of Kaddish, which is sanctification of yeah. God's name. So even by th turning things completely around, um, the, he fulfills a religious obligation. Yeah. Um, he. Wh what's the rabbi's point of view about uh, his acting this way? Oh, you mean like in general? The no, 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 no. The, the rabbi in this book. Uh, well, they treat him as a vandal, you know. I mean, to me, this is the idea. It's, fun, it's funny. This is the nice thing about coming out on the road. I never even thought of the idea of pikuach nefesh, which is if you can save a life, you're allowed to do anything, you know. There's a great in uh, The Big Lebowski, the Coen Brothers movie, where they got him driving on Friday night, John Goodman, but it's, you know. But this idea, you know, to me, I never even thought about that, in fact, that it would be justified as a pikuach nefesh idea. More it was for me the idea in this upside-down world that he's the one who loves this... The way these things happen, that I wanted to build a world where it could be logical for a man who loves this cemetery, who's the only one who remembers it for its great protector, to be destroying it, but for him to believe that, it, you know, or for it to be true. These oppose, back to the gray, these opposing realities. He feels like he is saving it, that memory is enough. But um, yeah, they, they just treat him as a vandal, and that, you know, even though they're ashamed of it. But I, I think it's all things. I think from the rabbinical side, it would be all things, even in this book. You know, that idea of the heartbreak, it destroyed gravestones, which is always gigantic and always has, you know, Holocaust memories to it and, and to the idea of, you know, trying to save it. But yeah, he's just, I guess the point is, whatever he does is wrong. Is I got very interested in the idea, walls and boundaries are very interesting to me, this idea that that was the last book. Here's the, here's the line between religious and secular. Here's the wall. We know what's on the other side. Here's a border. And for me, I became very interested, maybe living life as a writer or maybe living as other in Jerusalem, that the community pretends to hate it it's pariahs, but we need them to see who we are. You know, I, I just, you know, I was talking today about like Theo van Gogh, you know, like the things that I read about Holland, even like these extreme things where you say, what is it to cross this boundary? What is it like, this is not who we are. This is not what this country is, or yes, it is. You know, to me, we pretend that these things are, these people that shame us are terrible, but I feel like we need people on our side of the wall with which to reflect, you know? So I feel like that's, whatever he does is wrong, but they need him. So 
you know, the point is it's not fair. The rabbi won't see anything he does is right, but that, that's where I see it. And for his name, it got mentioned that his name is Kaddish, which is the prayer for the dead. This is actually, for me, a really beautiful Jewish tradition. But say a man has a heart attack and survives, he might then take on a new name. You know, in this book about identity, about bodies, who are we? To me, this idea that the angel of death comes with a list, and if he's looking for Nathan Englander, and I'm now David Englander, that he literally will not, it's not my physical body, my soul. You know, to me, that's such a beautiful, beautiful concept that that's how greatly we are our names. And in the book, Kaddish is a sickly child, and this is his blessing and curse where he's named Kaddish, so he should be the mourner instead of the mourned. But that is a terrible way to live, so. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Um, my name is uh, Freddy Bohm. Um, I had a question actually more on uh, your process of, of writing. Um, listening to you, I think you're, uh, you seem very perfection perfectionist in, uh, in, your, in your research. Yeah. Um, I think you said something along the lines of you don't really like the uncertainty in, in your own life. When, when is a book finished for you? When are you happy yeah, enough to say it's a, ready to go? That is a big question. Yeah, there's the, you know, our National Rifle Association, I use their saying in America, which is, you know, when they can pry it from my cold, dead hands. You know, that's... <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, uh, when, I, when, I, when I finished this book, an, an act, actor friend, she gave me this thing about, you know, Native Americans, about this idea of them weaving, you know, I think it's into carpets or just fabric, but that idea of weaving an error in because something that is too perfect of this world, you know, in a sense that's not perfect, that's imperfect because it's inhuman. You know, it, the spirit has to get out and move on to the next thing in a sense like freeing the muse. So for me, I guess you, you, what you're asking is so deeply personal because it is the line between uh, compulsive behavior, dedication to art, you know, being die hard, you know, and stubborn and living for this book and madness. You're really asking where the line is to madness and I think the line to madness is if you can't ever give it up. You can hold on to it for 10 years, for 20, but the idea is if it's never done, that's where you're insane. I might still be insane, but on that front, <laughs> it's that idea that I am of the world, like in the end I can handle it, you know, I can handle, you know, so this plane's on time and that plane's later, this works out and that doesn't work out, but yeah, in terms of story, there is a point where it can be done, but nothing must suffer. I asked my last question, I fixed my last comma, but there was a point where I was done, however long that takes. But I really think that you ask a really big question because there are, it's in the plague, which I love. I love when writers, I never talked about this out loud, but I feel like so many writers that I love in the great books, if you look, they've inserted their worst nightmare version of themselves. I'm talking about this with a friend, I sit in a coffee shop, and you always hate the people in the coffee shop that most remind you of your worst you know, people who like hug you when you don't want to be hugged, but they do it again and again, and you can say to them, don't hug me, I hate you, and then they hug you again. <laughs> and I say like, my God, what if every time I go up to somebody and I say hi and give them a hug, I see them smiling, but really they're saying I hate you and I don't hear it. You know, like, you can be really harsh on that kind of thing. And for me, I think these writers introduce sort of their, and in, in the plague, there's this guy who the whole book, it's so beautiful. They go and visit him again and again, and I think he's probably Camus' worst nightmare of self. He's just working on one sentence, you know, the horse, you know, gallop down the flowery, the gallop, you know, and I said, like, I think that's his talisman, that's how he protected himself, was building this character. Because you could, sentences are that complex and that beautiful, you could spend eternity, you could work one sentence till you're dead. I think that would keep me busy fine. Thank you. But yeah, that's, I do believe, it. but maybe it goes back to the earlier questions about writers that I love. I love Carver, I love, I do love the minimalists, you know, up to Dennis Johnson. I love a naked sentence. Other questions? One there in the back. Hello, I am Silvina Fratantoni and I am from Argentina. Ah, And um, I would down. like to know, uh, I, maybe you don't care, but, uh, what do you think the Argentinian people, especially the Jewish community, will say when they read the book? Oh, I don't care. Oh, that's, I care about that, but big. But uh, yeah, no, I was down there two months ago and uh, I was spending a Friday night dinner with a Jewish family and I showed up at their house. You know, grandma was there, all the, everyone's in a big circle around me and they say like, oh, the American, you know, the junkie writer is here. But you know, this idea, you know, they're like, what is your book about? And I was like, the two most painful, uncomfortable subjects that I could raise at a dinner. Like, this is just, no, it's, it's hugely important to me. I, I gave this book, I gave the manuscript to two Argentine friends who were, you know, they're like 
family to me now, but I said to them, one, especially my friend Donnie in Jerusalem, who's deeply sensitive and a wonderful reader, and I told him, like, I don't care, it's 10 years. If, if you do not give me your blessing, I will not put this out in the world. I will not, you know, and that, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm terrified about the Argentine reaction. I mean, I understand what I've done and what I am touching and what this is, and, you know, Again, has, it, has it already been uh, translated into Spanish? No, this is a very, uh, my translator's here. This is a very early translation, uh, unbelievably early. The uh, Dutch, because uh, it comes out so early, but, but Nicolette was translating from drafts, which is terrifying, you know, on that end. But I would set, finish a draft <laughs> and send it and then rewrite. So yeah, that'll come out in months. But uh, again, I, I wrote my heart out. Like it, it's now a personal, to me, this is my story in that way where I said what we are raised with, like the dirty war to me personally, not this book. To me it is the mothers of the plaza are of the great living heroes on this planet. It's a personal story to me now and I care about it deeply. So, you know, I, I hope Argentina gives it a chance, but you know, again, yeah, they might not, you know, maybe they'll burn it in piles, but you know, I, I, it's again, we'll just have to see what the intent is. Because as you know, as an Argentine, it's still living there. You know, people always ask, how do they deal with this memory? Like, deal with this memory. There's still a commercial on TV saying, you know, they have well, it's the grandmothers of the plaza. Like, if you, you know, a guy will be my age or older and say, if you don't know who your parents, if you don't, it's just shocking to me to have a commercial on TV now. Because they'd steal the babies. They would take these women, you know, these pregnant women, murder them, take their babies and give them away. You know, there are grandmothers still looking for their grandkids. It's insane and they arrested Isabelita I said just a few months ago like this is there has been no justice I think we have time for one more question if there is one well if there is nobody even on the front row there may be a second question I want to come back to this idea of uh, reading a novel like being in a dream because I have my doubts about this maybe too romantical uh, idea and when I think of uh, the history of for instance Ar Argentina I think where would we um, where should we stop of, of being uh, enchanted by for instance, a romancier or a, a TV director, everyone can take his or her audience into a sleepy dream. Um, yeah. Reading a novel like Dreaming is to me um, too dangerous. Uh, not like dreaming. Uh, the, it is the unbro I will stand by that absolutely till my dying day. It's not a romantic notion. It is the unbroken dream of reality. You know, it would be like it is its own world, and it better be a complete. I believe it better be a universe that rivals our own. You know, that would be like saying now this is not a life because we don't wake up and say, oh, actually, I'm already dead. You know, like to enter this. Yes, it has to be its own. Uh, dream is the only word I can use for it. But not dreamy, not soporific, not sleepy, not you know, enchanting, you know, it might be, you don't, in, in that, the whole world's confusing to me except for craft, and I feel like that is the benchmark. Yes, for me, when I read it, it's a perfect, complete world, and, you know, yeah, to me that is like, you know, yeah, it is like being in a dream for me when I am, you know, in a novel like that, and that is in my head a reality, that it stays with me, yeah. I guess I, I do stand by that as like a core thing, but yeah, not dreamy and not, yeah. For a writer, yes, but for the audience, for the reader. That is, that, that is always the trouble. That, that goes back, in, in a sense, to the Jewish identity question, all these things. I can only, so often I'm asked questions, you know, people say, like, who do you like better? Or is this character right or wrong? Like, I can only be in my, it, it took me a long time to get to this place. You know, I, I, you know, I've been a writer a long time now, even if I have a book every hundred years. But, but, the, but that idea is to recognize I am obligated. I cannot betray my point of view by saying what I think would be, you're looking at, I'm looking at all of you, you're all looking at me, it is a completely different, you know, I'm in my head and, and that is the way I have to see literature and that's how I have to believe in literature and I can't, you know, yes, I believe, I also believe everyone's right, you know, which is the horror. Like if you like the book, you are right. If you hate the book, you are right. Like I give this up. It's the, let's end with science. But uh, the proprioceptive relationship, to the you know we do not think 
move hand, you know, you move your hand, you move your fingers, that is your relationship to self. It's a whole separate process. And it took me a very long time to figure out my ob this book is not me, but my obligation to the book supersedes my obligation to self. So yes, I know where I am, I know where this book is, and I also, you know, if it's satisfying or not, like I'm aware where the reader is. But yes, for my relationship to literature, I believe that so deeply as my obligation. Anyway, okay. thank you. Thank you. We are not ending with science, but we're ending with a credo, even. Yes. Great. Um, thank you very much, Nathan. Um, the director of the John Adams Institute has left the building and has left me with what we call in Holland the Huishoudelijke Mededelingen. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, well, the house housekeeping is that. Well, the, how does it yeah, translate? Something, it's, uh, in, in New York, I everyone's like, we're going to do housekeeping now, and then they list, you know. <laughs> is there a native speaker in, <laughs> who can tell me what Huishoudelijke Mededelingen in, in America is in American? Nobody. No, wait. Housekeeping? Housekeeping? Well, it's not really that. Okay. Um, the first one being thanks um, the publishers of Anthos for their cooperation. Um, Nathan will sign his books uh, at this table if it doesn't... It'll be fine. Yeah, I'll well, put, if you put your foot on it, yes. Um, there are copies of the Dutch translation uh, available and also copies of the English uh, edition, I think. Uh, guests are welcome to stay and have a drink at the bar. The director of the John Adams Institute didn't say whether this is a paid drink or whether <laughs> you have to pay it yourself. I'm afraid it's the second, the latter. <laughs> and I would like I to thank you for coming to the John Adams Institute. Good evening.